Luke 17, verse 5. Jesus, in the midst of teaching here, the apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, If you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, that no doubt was present, He was pointing to, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time. Father, You are so incredibly good to Your people. Lord, I've been saying it. You're wonderful. You're magnificent. You're glorious. Lord, You're merciful and kind. Lord, You're marvelous. And we thank You for Your goodness to us. We thank You for giving us life. We thank You for Your Son. We thank You, Lord, that is, Lord, You are long-suffering. You enable us to be so by Your grace. Lord, I thank You this morning. I can stand before my brothers and sisters and say my, my wife was dead and is alive. Lord, miracles, uh, miracle of miracles, I praise You for it. Lord, I pray You'd bless this text. You'd bring it to life to us. You'd help me by Your Spirit to bring forth the things You've taught me and shown me. Lord, they'd be living realities in our hearts in, this, in the life of this church, Lord. And we, we indeed would have our faith increased and strengthened for the race that's before us. Father, bless our time now. We pray You'd remember our pastor and his wife and his children, Lord, as a Get away in the mountains, Lord, and may it be like the mountain of God. May they meet with You. May You bless them. May You refresh their souls. May Lord, give them what they need in this time away. Father, bless us as we open up Your Word today. Bless the teaching and preaching of it. We pray that You bless our fellowship. May Your people indeed be strengthened. May sinners be brought to repentance and faith. We ask in Jesus' name and for His sake, Amen. You know, I seek to be careful when I stand in this pulpit not to bring attention to myself or my personal life or anything that I feel would deter us away from the centrality of the person of Jesus Christ. Even so, there are times when God works in the preacher and it becomes so real and so impactful He feels compelled by a providence to share what God has so done. God has so wonderfully worked. And that part of that providence is not just for His own sake, but for the brethren He seeks to minister the Word of God to. A personal testimony of how God wonderfully brought this text out of my devotional reading into real life application that has resulted in incredible testimony of the power of God. That is, in the very least, strengthened and encouraged my own faith in Christ. And now, <clears throat> I have the privilege of having my bride seated in my presence <laughs> while I seek to proclaim God's truth, who's not only my bride, but now my sister in Christ. And despite all my praying and all my waiting, I honestly never thought I'd see the day. And I'm blown away by it still. And I'm just truly enjoying watching her discover, uh, realize, express all the things that God has done for her and is continuing to do for her. It's just glorious. And I, con I contrast this last week to the previous one, and it's like night and day. Ruby sent out that email telling them that, you know, that they had just arrived and their you know, current status and so forth, and she made a statement in there, something to the effect that God is so good. And then there was a dash that said, MASSIVE, all caps, MASSIVE UNDERSTATEMENT. And I could so identify with that statement. Well, before I get too carried away here, let's get to our text. The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, 
If you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Lord, increase our faith. Now let me see a show of hands this morning of brothers and sisters who would like their faith to be increased. <laughs> I think every one of us, no doubt, have expressed this very same thing we find the disciples expressing in this text. Every believer desires that. To be more trusting and dependent upon the One who's plucked them out of darkness and placed them into the kingdom of His dear Son. So let's imagine. Let's imagine you come to me and say, Brother, I really feel like my, my faith is waning. It is. And I desperately feel a need for it to be increased. Okay, brother, what is the root of the matter? Because I'm not making the connection here between increased faith and a little mustard seed. I'm not, I'm not getting it. I mean, a mustard tea, seed is very, very small. It's the smallest of seeds, from what I understand. And that's the problem. That's where I feel like my faith is. It's like the smallest of uh, faith that could be. The size of a mustard seed. And I'd like it to be big, as big as Pete's truck in comparison. How do I get there? Well, Jesus immediately deals with the problem of their thinking. And what was the problem of their thinking? They were fixated on their faith. Rather than being fixated on what they ought to be fixated on, the object of their faith, Jesus Christ Himself. And brethren, so much of our walk as Christians hinges upon how we think as Christians. We need to think right. And the only way we can think right is if we know what's right. And the only way we know what's right is if we're rightfully informed and taught. And that only comes by way of the Holy Spirit applying God's Word to our hearts and lives. And that's why we need God's Word daily. We, it's, it's necessary to inform us and teach us and rebuke us and mold us and uh, remind us and correct us and equip us. That's why we sit under preaching and teaching week after week. So our minds will be renewed. Our thinking will be in line with the thinking of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We can't think right if our mind is not upon what's right. We can't. Philippians 4, we read it Wednesday. And oh, how it spoke to my heart. Finally, brethren... I'm thinking in the King James. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. You will never walk in victory if you do not think in victorious ways. Ways that are righteous. Ways that God has shown us in His Word. This is what Jesus is addressing here. And His answer is twofold. First, if you would ever know the increasing of your faith, you must first know the object of it. Jesus said, it's me. Faith in and of itself is worthless. I mean, the world talks about faith. They speak about faith today. Many people are exercising faith in this, that, and the other. But they don't know Christ. They don't possess a saving faith that knows and loves Jesus Christ. It's a worthless faith. It's a dead faith. So faith in and of itself is meaningless without being connected to Christ. And so I come upon this verse again in my devotional reading a few weeks back. And I, I, maybe this is too strong a statement, but I felt like the text was mocking me. I felt similar ways about John 14, 14. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, Jesus says, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So what you're saying is, if in the smallest measure of faith possible, I can call out to my crepe myrtle tree right there, and command it to be ripped out of the ground and thrown into the middle of the road there, 
It'll happen, right? Surely that's not what you're teaching, Lord. Lord, you don't want me going down the street plucking out trees out of my neighbor's yard and casting them into the road. Hey neighbor, watch this. Watch what my mustard seed faith will do. That's not what God wants. It makes no sense. It's, it's completely out. First of all, it's completely outrageous. Secondly, it does nothing whatsoever to advance your kingdom, Lord. Thirdly, it does nothing whatsoever to point people to Jesus Christ or the gospel. And thirdly, it's just impossible. It's impossible. Who in their right minds even heard of such things happening? And it struck me. That's it. That's exactly why Jesus says what He says. You see, Jesus' response is not a rebuke on the absence of the disciples' faith, but rather instruction informing them that first of all, I must be the object of your faith, not your faith. Although Christ being the object of the faith is not directly referred to here, it's most certainly implied. Dear disciples, you're coming at this thing all wrong. You spent some time with me. You've witnessed some powerful workings, some wonderful workings of God. I've given you a taste of glory. You want more of it. You want to know more of me. You want to live your lives out for my glory. You want to advance the kingdom of God and see great and many mighty things. But you must, you must, you must know this. My kingdom does not advance according to the quantity of men's faith, but according to the power of God. And the realization of that power does not lie in how great your faith is, but rather in the simplest of faith, be it mustard size, seed, seed size, such faith laying hold of the power of God. And by pointing the disciples to a little mustard seed, Jesus gives a very vivid display an illustration that this thing is not about the quantity of faith here, but all about faith's object. God uproots mulberry trees. Not men. God does. You see, this thing doesn't depend on you. Oh, you're vitally connected to it. You're involved because guess what? Without faith, that tree's not moving. It's not. But Jesus wants His disciples to know and He wants us to know that whatever circumstances in life require your faith, and really it's everything, but there are times where we feel that need more. Whatever circumstances, the demonstration of God's power is not rooted in you, you mustering up some certain level of faith, not even rooted in you worrying about the measure of faith that you have, but Jesus would divert all such thinking to Himself. He wants us to be trusting in His power, His might, his ability, His power, Him. Him alone. And when faith, whatever size it be, be it Pete's truck size or a little tiny pebble, such faith will witness and know and demonstrate the power of God. Such faith will see mulberry trees plucked up and cast into the sea. Well, I mentioned his answer is twofold. Secondly, I'm persuaded that Jesus uses this ridiculous illustration. Not only because pictorially the imagery is clear. You can see it. You can imagine it. But the nature of its impossibility communicates to us some very important spiritual truth. Whatever measure of faith you esteem yourself to have, do not under any circumstances whatsoever limit God to the realm of what you only you seem to be seem to think possible. In other words, Jesus wants his people to gaze so confidently upon him, to lean so heavily upon him, to rest so securely in his arm, to, to bank so much upon his power that things which seem so impossible, so necessary for divine intervention, miraculous intervention, in order to be accomplished, those things not only become possible, they become a living experience. They become actual realities. Jesus wants you to know, brother or sister, I move mulberry trees. I do. 
I'm in the business of transplanting immovable, rooted objects. It doesn't matter how long they've been anchored in place. It doesn't matter how big they are, how deep the roots have gone down. I move mulberry trees. And I do it to my delight. I rip them right out of the ground where they're bound and I set them free by planting them in a new location altogether. Oh, brethren, he presses this truth over and over. Without me, you can do nothing. With men, this thing, it's impossible. With men, it is. But not so with God. With God, all things are possible. If you but trust in Him, in His power, His wisdom, His time, you'll see mountains turn to valleys. You'll see trees being tossed into seas. You'll see much more than that, brethren, because He says, in fact, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in Me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will He do. Works of impossibility in the eyes of men. Works of miracle. Jaw-dropping works that leave one... Standing in an awe, thinking almost as if they were seeing a tree ripped up, ripped up out of the ground, flying over the house and cast into the sea. Just unbelievable. And brethren, I've seen it. I've seen it with my own two eyes. A lifeless, dead, barren mulberry tree rotting away, full of corruption, and suddenly plucked up by its roots and thrown into the sea of life where it's already bearing fruits of righteousness to the glory of God, and she's sitting right there. Lord, what, what's the, what is the mulberry tree? I was asking him in my yard that night. What's the impossible thing, Lord, you want me to ask you for? Because you're going to do it. All things are possible to the one who believes. God doesn't mock His people. God doesn't lie. Whatever you ask in My name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in My name, I will do it. And so I asked for over 19 years. Through many trials, and many disappointments and many sorrows and professions of faith, I kept asking. And honestly, it must have been mustard seed, maybe even half of a mustard seed. Because the unbelief of my request was only growing stronger and stronger as each year passed. My own bride had become the greatest trial of my life, and yet strangely, she was significantly used of God as a means of drawing me closer to my Savior. Things had become so bad, and expressions against God and His people so strong, I was beginning to fear for my wife there was no hope whatsoever. She crossed the line. This person is that person we see in Hebrews 6 and 10. And yet I kept praying. Continue to pray. Shortly after joining Grace here, I, the Lord burdened me to start setting aside one lunch hour a week to fast for my, my family, my wife and my children. I was determined. I'm not going to just sit by and chalk up the damnation of my family to sovereign purposes. I'm not doing it. If hell swallows them up, it better not be due to the lack of my intercession for them. And during that time, I just learned to wait upon the Lord. And there were some seasons where I felt a little bit of assurance that God was going to do something. But I have to say, there were more seasons where I felt like it was hopeless. No hope. Then something happened, brethren. When Carlos, Tim, and I went to, over to Indonesia, we met these unsuspecting ladies. And you know, really, they embody that text in Isaiah 53 that depicts our Lord, where it says, He had no form or majesty that we should look at Him. That was these ladies. No beauty that we should desire them. He was despised and rejected of men. He was despised and we esteemed Him not. That was these ladies. 
in the scriptures in 1 Corinthians that say, God chose what is foolish in the world to change the, shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in His presence. If you've never seen, she stands maybe four, four and a half feet tall. She has some form of dwarfism. She hobbles as she walks. She looks so frail and feeble, and yet, I'm telling you, the power of Christ rests upon this woman. There's something about it. Ernie as well. And Trevor calls them the secret weapons in the spiritual warfare taking place on that island. And we had the privilege of meeting them and hearing their testimony, and I think many of you have read Ernie's. Trevor, having already heard it, was weeping as he heard it again. Just an incredible story of the power and grace of God. And so he comes up next and she shares this, her miraculous conversion. And then afterward, while we're sitting there talking, I don't even remember what we were talking about specifically, but she just sort of nonchalantly throws out there, oh yeah, God answers all my prayers. And this is not a boastful woman. This is a very humble woman. This is a woman with the Spirit of God's upon these women were prayer warriors. And so when she made that comment, you better believe it perked up Tim and I's ears. And I asked her, I said, Sister, will you please pray for my wife? Her name is Shirley. And then Tim said, I would like you to pray for my daughter, Grace. So then CT closes us in prayer, and as she's praying, <laughs> I felt this woman to some degree, bring me into the presence of God. And as she was praying for my wife, I was in tears, and I was certain God heard that woman. Certain of it. And yet, knowing all the history, and evidence, and life of my wife, I struggled with believing it. It's, it's odd how that could be two things at once. Yet, all that changed in May of 2009 when my brother-in-law suddenly died in shocking fashion. While I was grieved for my wife knowing how difficult it was for her. At the same time, I was hoping that somehow, some way, God would use this event to break my wife. To draw him to her, or draw her to him. Well, the exact opposite happened. What was already a rocky relationship became so volatile, I was preparing my heart for the worst. And I remember sharing with Kenny, right behind that pillar right there, sharing, sharing with him, I was hoping this event would break my wife, bring her to repentance, and instead it's made a hard heart even harder. And I remember Kenny saying this, and it seemed prophetic at the time, and even much more so now. He said, perhaps things will get much worse before God saves Shirley. He was right. Last fall, my father-in-law had a stroke. Knowing how much my wife loved her father, I, I, knew, I knew this thing was either going to make matters much worse, or it would, this would be the time that God was going to do it. This was going to be the time He'd break her. Unfortunately, it was the former. Things had become so strained, trying to love a wife who was spiraling down at rapid pace, lead a family, working full-time and now into overtime preparing messages. I got to the place I, I couldn't take it anymore. When Shirley took the kids up to Michigan with visit relatives, I was left all alone at home and I needed it. All alone with the Lord. Me and the Lord. And I took that time. I was desperate. I was in desperation. I needed God to do something. So I prayed and fasted alone in my closet. I remember that night God met with my soul in tears of grief in exasperation, I pleaded with him to stop my wife. Because she's going to end up destroying herself, and we weren't going to make it. I knew it. The writing was on the wall. And so I desperately, I pleaded with him. Save her, Lord. Get, and my great desire was, Lord, I, I can't do this anymore. I've been doing this for 19 years. I, Lord, I just want a wife that loves you and worships you. Lord, give me a Christian wife, please. 
One I can serve the Lord with. One I can grow in grace with. One that... I remember asking the Lord specifically, Lord, please give me a Christian wife. If, it, if somehow you could save Shirley, Lord, do it. Stop this. Stop this run of rebellion. Just, Lord, do it somehow. But I had great doubt that He would. Lord, I, I can't stop her. I've tried. But Lord, if not, if it pleases you to let her go her way, then Lord, please work things out in such a way somehow do I can have a Christian wife. And I even had the boldness to say, Lord, by next Christmas, please, please. And brethren, I, I don't know how to explain. This has only happened a handful of times in my life. But I felt such a breaking through at the throne of God. I was certain as God heard my prayer. It was just like thing. Somehow God was going to bring this to pass. And somehow God was going to give me a Christian wife this Christmas. I, I, I knew it. I was certain of it. I didn't know how it was all going to play out. But I knew it was going to be. Well, then the following weeks, our, our, our beginning of the year, the week of prayer and fasting, Tim challenged us to ask God for impossible things. That really stayed with our sister and impacted her. So she acted upon that and asked the Lord, Lord, please burden my heart. and Give me faith to ask for things that you're going to be pleased to do. Impossible things. And as she prayed and asked the Lord, the Lord laid two people on her heart. My wife and Grace Conway. And so... She's asking the Lord. The Lord gives her these names. She tells me that later that week, you know, I asked, you know I've been seeking the Lord and I, I got a burden for your wife. I've been praying for your wife. And I thought, well, you know, that's, that's nice. I appreciate that. You consider it, you know, thoughtful of my wife. And I didn't really think a whole lot of it. Little did I know that burden was real. And it was God wrought. And a couple weeks later, she'd tell me, I'm, I'm praying for your wife daily. And I, I kind of thought, really? Wow. It was kind of like, the only way I've been able to explain it in my mind is kind of like Mary, when the Scripture says she pondered these things. Because I'm, I'm looking at this thinking, Lord, why? This seems to be real. I mean, it seems to be of you. Why would you have her praying for my wife? She didn't even know my wife. She didn't even know Shirley's name. She didn't. God gave her this burden to pray for. And so I'm thinking, this is really peculiar. Lord, what's going on? And then all of a sudden, these, these letters are coming in the mail. From unmarked, unnamed, just encouraging my wife, pointing her to the Lord. And uh, I, mean, I was still largely swimming in disbelief, but at the same time, I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, what is going on here? These letters start showing up, and uh, Shirley wasn't exactly jumping for joy to receive them. In fact, she got to the point where she wouldn't even read them. She saw it. She could identify what it was. She ripped it up and threw it on my desk. And there was one time she told me, she thought she knew who it was. She goes, you better, you better tell them to stop sending them or I'm going to do it and it's not going to be pretty. I, was, I didn't know. I told her, I honestly don't know who it is. It's the Lord. <laughs> and uh, I, I was loving it, really. She wasn't, but I was. And... Uh, <clears throat> So here I am thinking about these things and pondering them and I thought, Lord, if Shirley's yours and you're going to save her and she hasn't bowed the knee in, in, in light of what's happened to her brother or her, da her dad's stroke, Lord, what's, what's it going to take? Lord, what's next? Me? And I started thinking it might be me if God's going to save her. Yeah, I had a hard time even believing it was going to happen. By the way, the sender of that card was... Well, when things, when things blew up a couple weeks ago, I just had to get away and seek the Lord. I had to be alone. And, you know, I, I shared the things I shared with you on that Wednesday night. I had to know this. I had to know, Lord, this must be you working out the details of your promise to me of that request back in December. I just don't know how you're purposing to work it out. I need to know. And I told you I was having a hard time reconciling some things in my mind. And in my quest to get alone with God, I started getting some feedback 
that appeared that the Lord might have saved my wife. I was wanting no communication. That's hard to do in this church, but I was trying to, <laughs> I was trying to get totally alone. And uh, I, I mean, I did for the most part. And when I heard that, I was quite resistant to it at first. In fact, Tim comes over and visits and said, you know, Ruby had gone over to pick up the girls or dropped them off and she had a discussion with Shirley. And she, t- Craig, she said, she believed God saved her. And I remember my response was like, oh, Ruby, come on. <laughs> and Tim's just kind of silent, not really certain what to think. And... Uh, you know, I gave all my reasons why that seemed so convenient and I wasn't buying it and, you know, wanting to believe it, but very leery of it. So there I am alone again on Don and Kenny's floor. And it hits me. My wife is the mulberry tree. when I was watering those crepe myrtles, I asked the Lord, what is the mulberry tree? What's this impossible thing you trust? You would have me trust you for. And actually it was something different that the Lord gave me at that time. What seemed so impossible, it would unquestionably require the power of God to do it. God showed me right then. He plucked my wife out of, bond, out of the bondage of her darkness and completely transformed her heart and placed her into the kingdom of His Son. And as I've watched the Lord work over the years, I'm greatly encouraged when God's people are laden with burdens, brethren. Don't take burdens lightly. Because burdens cast upon the Lord will see their fruit in due season, in God's time. So be encouraged. Don't give up. I just want to tell you what the, the burden God gave me. I just want to share this because I want you to enter into it because I, I believe it's from the Lord. When I was out watering my crepe myrtles, there's not just one mulberry tree. God, in this time, God, what He did is He gave me the fullness, the fruition of a mulberry tree and showed me the next one. Lord, what would be impossible? I, I want to pray for something that's just Impossible. This is before I found out about, before Shirley was saved. And the thought came to my mind, 5,000 souls. And 5,000, specifically 5,000 Quechuan souls. And I, that's when Ryan and uh, Nicole were still here and the flask pours gearing up to go. And it just, I mean, it came to me and I thought, that's it, Lord. I'm praying it. I believe it's from you. Five thousands. Lord, won't it be glorious? We get in glory, and there's the Lord. He says, here they are, all five thousand of them. And what glory He'll get from that, because we trusted in Him for it. The power of God to do it. To me, that seems absolutely impossible, brethren. In fact, I thought, I, can I share this with a brother? They're going to think, that, that's, just, that's ridiculous. But so is plucking mulberry trees and throwing them into the sea. And that's exactly why the Lord uses the illustration. I'm the God of the impossible. If you'll but believe me for the impossible, you'll see it happen. You'll see it happen. And it might be 19 years, or 19 months, or 19 days. I don't know. But I'm trusting God for 5,000 catch you in souls. And brethren, I ask you to enter into it with me. I'm not letting go till the day I die, till the day I see it. It may not be till glory, but I'm expecting to see 5,000 souls saved by Jesus Christ for His glory. I trust it to be so. Brethren, let's lay hold of God for impossible things. He's worthy of our trust. He's worthy of our praise. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Okay, speaking in front of people is like one of my biggest fears. Um, I, uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail when I was little, but you know, younger, when I was younger, my parents didn't go to church. We kind of went with my grandma sometimes. Um, and then I went to a vacation Bible school when I was five and raised my hand, you know, so I thought I was saved. Um, when I was like 11, my great-grandma was getting baptized, and I wanted to be baptized too, so I'm like, yeah, I'm saved. I said the prayer. And then when Craig and I were dating and engaged to be married, I had a profession. Um, I said the prayer, you know, again. So 
I was baptized and I thought that I was saved. Um, we moved to Texas in 1994. Um, I can see I can see now that God moved us here, whereas for 16 years that I've been here, I've always hated it. And I'm like, how do you know God wants us here? God is everywhere. We can be anywhere. We can be back in Michigan, you know. Um, but anyway, I we moved down here to community. You know, people were giving their testimonies and stuff, and I'm thinking, well, I don't know what to say. What if they ask me? You know, I'm really scared. And so, uh, you know, I came to the realization I wasn't saved then, and I thought God had saved me a couple weeks later. Well, I went through this profession for I don't know how long, um, and I don't remember the timeline, but that's not important. Um, Nine years? Oh, okay, nine years. Anyway, um, I've had three, you know, I've had a lot of professions, but um, my last one, I, uh, we were, Craig and I were supposed to meet with our pastor at the time, Kyle. Um, I guess they wanted to talk to me because they didn't see any fruit in my life. And I knew I wasn't saved at that time Cause, because I asked myself the question, can I say that I love Jesus Christ? And I, this was going in my mind like every day, and I thought, I can't, I cannot say that. So when we met with our pastor, I, I think I kind of shot Craig and Kyle because I was like, I'm not even saved. And they're like, oh, okay. And I thought I, I felt such a freedom, being free from having to go to church every week, being free from having to put on a show, and I didn't have to force myself to read the Bible every day, which I wasn't doing anyway, so who was I fooling? But uh, I really wasn't free, you know? Um, I was just bound in my own uh, bondage and a sin. Um, my thought life, I mean, I went from being very religious, you know, to where I just had these long, long dresses, and not that, you know, that, I mean, that's okay if you're wearing one, but uh, I, uh, I went from being very, very religious, um, and then these past years, was that 2005 when it, did that happened? We met with Kyle? Oh, well, anyway, um, I, uh, all these years, you know, um, Craig came to this church, and I, I had visited a little bit. Um, I wouldn't go to church every week with the family, um, you know, because I enjoyed my alone time, quiet time, whatever, whatever I was doing, shopping, you know. Um, but I was, I, I didn't really realize it at the time, but I was spiraling deeper and deeper into my sin. My thoughts were evil. I hated God. I hated everyone here. Um, I would delete my Facebook friends who put scripture verses up. I didn't want to see them, so I would delete these people. Um, not all of you guys, but most of you. And then, uh, anyway, um, my brother passed away last year, as you guys know, from a massive heart attack. Um, you would think that God, you know, would use that to open my eyes. It just made me more and more bitter and hardened, and I took all this bitterness toward God out on Craig. So, you know, I look back now at... The years of just being cruel to my husband, I was so cruel to him. And, and I was going through emails, you know, just last week after God saved me, I was going through all our emails from all the way back to 2003, 2004. And in every email, I'm so, I mean, not every email, but even in the emails where I'm really mean to him, he just points me to Christ and he shows me love, you know, Christ's love. Um, well, last week, you know, all the stuff that happened, I, we, not last, was it last week or two weeks ago? Okay, well, Craig left for the week, and, uh, you know, it was good that he was gone, and we were both alone, and I met with Tim and Ruby on Tuesday, because um, I pretty much was down, I, I say that I was at the bottom of the pit. I wasn't, I couldn't go any lower. I mean, you know, I was pretty humbled. What, what was I going to do? The only thing I can do is cry out to Christ. So I met with Tim and Ruby on Tuesday, and I told, I told Tim, okay, I'm crying out to, to God, but how do I know if he's going to save me? How do I know? And he says, you'll know. And, you know, when I had my professions, I always struggled with, am I saved, am I not? You know, the doubt was always there. Um, you know, and then Ruby had told me, because I told her that I just hit rock bottom, and she says, you know, Corey Ten Boom's sister, Betsy, had said on her deathbed, there's no pit deep, deep enough that God is not deeper still. And so that really encouraged me. But I, you know, I counseled with Tim and Ruby, and I had talked to a couple people on the phone. 
um, and I was leaving Craig alone, you know, and, uh, well, I, I d didn't want to call and talk to a lot of people. I didn't feel like that was right. I felt like I really just needed to be alone, just me reading the Bible and, and praying, you know, which is really weird. But um, I know that I can look back now and see that God had planned this whole entire thing. Um, so I just cried out to him, and I was just, I, I didn't feel like watching TV. I didn't want to be on the computer, which is, you know, if you knew me, that's really weird. Um, but I just cried out to him, you know, every day. I, my, my poor kids, you know, they're, they're like, I don't even know what they were thinking, but I told the Hope and Luke one morning, I said, Mommy's crying a lot because I'm trying to find Jesus. Um, but anyway, I don't know if it was Tuesday or Wednesday, but, you know, I uh, felt like, uh, oh, let me back up a little bit. I had sent these two emails to these two ladies on Facebook who were members of the church here to, and told them never to talk to my husband. I said, because I wanted to just be mean because, you know, I couldn't stand God, so I didn't want, I wanted Craig to pay for that. And I told these ladies, don't talk to him, don't email him, I don't want you anywhere near him. I mean, that's so evil. Um, but immediately on Tuesday or Wednesday, I felt like I needed to apologize to these people. And I, I didn't realize then, but I felt a love for these ladies. And so I emailed them and told them, I'm sorry, I'm trying to seek out Christ. Please pray for me if you can, I, you know, because I was so rude to you. Um, well, one of them emailed me back pretty quick, and she said, I'm praying for you. Um, I don't, you know, I forgive you, don't worry about it. And she sent me a John Piper message, which, you know, I just, I had to watch it. And it was on First Peter 1.22, and he's saying, you know, John Piper even said, one of your first fruits is love for the brethren. And I was like, that's it. That was my first, I mean, that, I knew God had saved me at that point because all of a sudden I felt a love for you people and I hated you. I did. Um, I didn't want anything to do with this church. Uh, um, I had been listening, I mean, I, the, this is why I say I went from being super religious all the way to the other end of the spectrum to where I was listening to some heavy metal, like rock music. I loved it. Um, just thinking evil, like super duper evil thoughts. I would cuss in my mind. I wouldn't do it hardly at all at home in front of my kids. But, you know, in the car, I have serious road rage. And I would just, like, you know, greet people that cut me off on the road. Just, you know, it was bad. But instantly, instead of the music in my mind, it was scripture songs, scripture hymns that I had not heard in years or sung in years was in my mind. I did not feel a bitterness anymore towards anybody. My heart just felt softened. I felt a compassion. I was watching like Christian music on YouTube and they would, you know, people put like pictures to this music and I would see pictures of different people and it, my heart just went out to them, you know, like little uh, starving children in Africa with distended bellies. I just, let me back up a little now. I have also been a racist um, to the point where I, I wanted to join the KKK. But my husband, I knew he would never do that. But, and I didn't want the government to track me, that kind of thing. Um, I would be like on white supremacist sites and stuff. And I would be like, yeah, you know, go, go. Um, just thinking I was so much better than people, you know, self-righteous, big time. God took that from me because I saw that in the, in the video, these little black kids, and I just let, and I thought, you know what, God, if you wanted me to adopt a, a Haitian orphan, I would do it. And Craig had asked me that a few months back, it, you want to adopt a Haitian orphan? I'm like, no way. I don't want a baby. I don't even want it. I don't want a black baby, you know. But now if God wanted me to do that, I would. Um, anyway, the songs and stuff, he just took all this stuff from my mind, my heart, my thought life is just clean and it just feels so much better. I have a hunger for God's word. I'm, I'm, I love to read the Bible um, and like, I like to watch the um, testimonies on YouTube. I watched yours. Um, I like to just watch sermons and listen. Um, you know, but these, these uh, scripture songs and stuff were going through my mind that I had not thought of in years and then there's one hymn it's, uh, I sought the Lord, and afterward I knew that he sought my soul to seek him seeking me. It was not I that found no Savior true, but I was found of thee. So um, 
I, I'm so thankful to God for saving me because I was just going down and down. I mean, I almost destroyed my, my family and my marriage. You know, I just was so blind, so blind, you know, thinking that the world has so much to offer of me more than Christ, but Christ is everything. You know, I said, I told the Lord, I said, you know what? I said, I'm not going to bargain with you. I just, I know I need you. I need Christ. I need you in my life. You need to run my life. I'm not going to bargain with you. If you took my, my husband and my kids or just my husband or whatever, I would be okay. Because if I had you, I would be okay. So I thank God and I'm, I'm praying for my children now. I'm praying for my parents and my brother's friend Paul. I'm praying for all of them that God would reach down and pluck them out like he did me. So I'm just very thankful. And all the glory goes to God. Yes. So. If you have any questions, you can ask me later. <laughs> oh. oh, it's fine. I love you guys. Love you too. <laughs>